previously on your favorite episode. To make sure that, you know, he still got it. Today, we are going to be talking to our good friend, one of my favorite people to spoke a bone with, and a marvelous personality around Orlando, one of the hosts of Blue La La Entertainment, Sam Malloy. Sam Malloy uh, is coming to talk to us about my very first episode of uh, all the way through of Doctor Who. And I, I've got to admit, that's modern Doctor Who. I don't want to sound like I'm I'm too cool, but I did watch some of the uh, Tom Baker and, and other doctors in high school, though I remember none of that. We watched the episode Vincent and the Doctor from Series 5, Episode 10, which aired on June 5th, 2010. Vincent and the Doctor. TV rots your brains. That's absurd. TV only softens the brain like a ripe banana. Television. Much of our future depends on the way we use this medium of communication. Uh, I will say uh, thank you uh, very much uh, for uh, being here. Wait, wait, wait. No, that's not how we're going to start. Didn't we have an idea of something that we wanted to do? when we got the person on that we needed to... to, Oh, no, no, it was in our intros we needed to introduce ourselves. Yes. That was the thing. Go go do it now, though, so we don't forget, because if we... We'll forget. Oh, okay. Yeah. We could just be like, hey, I'm Jackie. Yeah. And and you're Trevor. And I'm Trevor. Welcome again to another episode of your favorite episode. Let's call it an edition and not an episode. Another edition of your favorite Another edition? It is another edition of your favorite episode and tonight with us we have the lovely and talented uh gal about town she is uh uh hosted and uh uh she has hosted any number of uh burlesque events in this town Uh, anybody in the dance community uh knows her well she is a custom jeweler a history buff a booze aficionado and uh, a all-around C-list Orlando celebrity, her words, not mine. I put her at the very top of the game, Miss Sam Malloy. Thank you very much for being with us tonight. Thank you so much for having me. And with us is actually uh, with us, uh, uh, kind of, in that uh, two of you are in the same physical location. Yes. Um, uh, Jackie and Sam are recording in different rooms of the same house right now so that they can keep hanging out uh, yes. <laughs> when we are done. What are you guys watching uh, when you guys are hanging out after we're done? Do we, we did know? not decide yet. We only decided what to eat. I only think chicken wings. We started, <laughs> we started Pea Valley, right? We did first you and episode I started of Pea Valley. Valley. No, I, Sam. I haven't and I. started Pea oh. Valley with you yet. Well, then that's what we're going to do. We're going to start okay, Pea Valley. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the, that's the, the first, like, that, like Theo's... Fried chicken. If you haven't watched Pea Valley with me, you're gonna watch Pea Valley with me. You're, um, you're gonna, yeah, you're gonna I'm love excited. it. You're gonna love it. You only give me the best shows, so I'm, I'm, I'm jazzed. <laughs> it's. I'm she's like not a TV dealer. Yeah. <laughs> you are a TV dealer. That is kind of just what we are here to do: is uh, hook people on the television. Which brings us to tonight's selection, uh, which is one of the most uh, hookiest of shows. It's one of those shows that's so hooky that its fans get names. Whovians. Uh, of course, I'm speaking of uh, the long, 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 long running, or at least since 2005 running, Doctor Who. That's technically the reboot. It has been running since 1963. Right, 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 right. It's, a, it's continuity. The, the, the storyline, uh, the story continuity works uh, with the thing. Fans of this show, uh, which uh, surprises me, and uh, I, I just genuinely wonder who you are. But fans of this show uh, may be surprised to learn that I uh, know very little uh, about the Doctor Who uh, universe there. I, uh, it is just... Everybody has the sci-fi that they miss. Everybody has the sci-fi that they... Nothing. Yeah. Nothing on so, Star Trek. No idea. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah same. Right. I'm no Star Trek, but that's why Sam's here to tell us about Doctor Who. About Doctor Who. So we have with us a Whovian, uh, yes. and I'm looking forward to her telling us about it. But um, if you can, let's start with just the premise of the series. 
explain to us what the general idea of Doctor Who is. So the Doctor is a time-traveling alien. Um, he can and does regenerate into new people, but he retains the same memories and the same emotions. Um, it's a... time and space there's literally nothing off guard he has some really cool very creative enemies um and he always does the right thing and tries to save the humans even though we're stupid and definitely not worth it and that's sort of like his uh his whole like mo um is is just like yeah i am uh unbelievably benevolent for a reason that you'll never really understand you'll you'll never know he'll never tell you yeah. He's just going to be sad with his secrets and carry on right. making the world better for everybody else. At least he's going to try. And he is of the sort of sci-fi power level that is like Rick Sanchez uh, in that he is kind of, um, there's a technology for almost everything and it's some strange thing, you know, whatever needs to be done uh, can can be invented or has been invented or is somewhere. It's not, I, I'm going to let you know, I have no idea who Rick Sanchez is, but he does have a oh. TARDIS that he travels in. Did I, oh no, no did I mess yes. something up? I don't no, no, know. no, that's fine. That's fine. Rick you Sanchez Rick is the Rick Morty? of Rick and Morty. Um, oh yeah, that one's lost on me. I'm so okay, sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh. But basically, okay. So essentially I just mean a kind of God level, anything that he needs to do, he can do. There is a lot of technology that he has that he just so has there's a lot he of- needs it technology that he does have yes like he has a tardis um he, he has um uh, he has a sonic screwdriver but it doesn't like it always works out in his favor like yes he has tools at his disposal but it doesn't mean that he's godlike and it can just automatically be better right. like he can take a tardis bring him to another time and space to get information or people that he needs he can have a sonic screwdriver to like read the room or a piece of paper or figure out what's going on but it's not always going to go well. The sonic screwdriver will screw him over. Uh, his paperwork will not come through. Like it, it, there really is some really like humbling humanistic characteristics to the character, which makes it really nice. So it's like essentially the the technology is there, but it is almost there to fail at at whatever crucial moment in the story. Uh, you know, it needs to fail so that we can, you know, as an audience, can... our hero, absolutely, exactly, right, 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 and it does. It makes him more of a hero uh, than Rick Sanchez, but that is a conversation for another day. Another day. <laughs> um, yeah, it's a whole, whole different thing about what happens if it always goes right, and uh, then what do you become? In any case, um, the uh, he. He is this kind of sci-fi, though, where it's it's not always explained. It's not like Star Trek, where there's a very rigid, you know, structure. No, it's very influenced by uh, pop culture and history. Um, like this episode, he visits Van Gogh. There's another one that I love, mm-hmm. um, where he uh, he's in Marie Antoinette's court. There's another one like where he is. There's another one where his spaceship becomes a person and they're on a desolate planet together. Like there are so many different scenarios that it right. really, it, it, there is no structure to it. It really can't right. be ever. The showrunners are really into that week or that month. And that that's what makes it fun. It, they can stay relevant with it. Yeah. 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 And that's, and exactly that's, that's kind of the, the, the whole ethos of the show. I, 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 I appreciate the idea and 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 for anybody who who uh um doesn't know the the history like we said this goes back to um 1963 Yes, it's 1963. 63 is Martin the Brady. start of the show. There we go. Okay. So, uh thank you Hoovian again. So, <laughs> since 1963 and um it was very notable in it was a British show and it was very, very notable early on for its low budget uh, was one of the things that that was recognizable about it. Uh, and it was that they made all of these very iconic sci-fi props uh, and sci-fi storylines out of like very bizarre things, a Dalek. I was about to say, uh, Daleks is the first thing that come to my mind. Yeah. 
Daleks and Cybermen right. are going to be like my go-to hilarity. Because you know what defeats Daleks? And I will die on this hill. Stairs. Right. I don't care about I don't care about your new school, your new school floating Daleks. I think they're dumb. I still think it's hilarious. Stairs. Exactly. Stairs. And they're the most ruthless thing in the universe. Terrified. Wiped out countless civilizations. <laughs> All they do is walk forward and say and then things die. They just and that's it. And so and that's and 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 again, I really appreciate the the commitment to um that it doesn't matter the the effects or the uh the um you know but the, what matters is the creativity is 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 what's on display and there's and the use of sci-fi of concepts what there's also a certain level of camp to it yeah oh oh well there's, of course it, it's it's british humor sci-fi like the like you're definitely in on the joke for sure yeah. like they're not hiding the fact that the props are meh they're not right. hiding it from you. Everyone's in on it. One of the things I love about the props is with certain ones, you can like pick apart what they used to be. Mm-hmm. Oh, God, like yeah. You can see that used to be a lawn chair. Yeah. That is not a whatever it's supposed to be. And that's so fun to me when you can do that with the TV show. Oh, yeah. I still love that they use the same 27 actors. <laughs> <laughs> I know they have right. more. I'm well yeah. aware of it. Yeah. But they just keep rotating them out and honestly impressed. Right. I like that they kept one of my favorite things was when they did the reboot that they kept the technology inside the the TARDIS relevant to the to the 60s because when he first showed up it was all stuff glued together that came from 60s you know tech and 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 whatnot and since he's an immortal time lord it can't have just been that that's when the show started and that's what the props were it has to be that was the best stuff. That's what it looks like. I just think they just kept with it because uh, the the doctor's not a fussy man. He wouldn't. He wouldn't. He right. wouldn't upgrade. It would change. It would be different. He wouldn't know how to use it anymore, and we all know it. He would be like, I don't. I don't know. What He's is already this? been through all the times, though, right? He knows what the future is. He could have upgraded at any time. He. This must have been the one. That like you know this is you think, you think this is the premium one you think this is this, like the perfect yeah model? I think he's seen all the tech and he's like this is the tech this this is it's, the thing you're telling me it's not a Tesla yeah right it's not a Tesla it's absolutely not a Tesla absolutely not a Tesla <laughs> no 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 that uh, that was guaranteed that was always guaranteed so the Doctor is this immortal Time Lord the Doctor that we are at in this in this episode. Tell me a bit about Matt Smith's doctor. He's my doctor. He's my first doctor. Everyone will always tell you about their first doctor. They'll always, if you ever talk about Doctor I Who. I literally Whovian, just did that. I literally just did every, that in the living room. Literally every Whovian will be like, oh yeah, no, this is, uh, Jackie's was Christopher Eccleston and he's incredible. Who was yours? Uh, I, the, Tom Baker. But So Tom Baker was the first episode you ever saw. Yeah. Was well, it, I saw him? it back in the nineties as a kid, like as a kid. And reruns on. I mean, uh, that's, BBC. but you still remember your first one. Yeah. Oh yeah. Oh no. I I absolutely did. And uh, and but again, I remember very little about what was happening. All I remember was like like some weird, uh, very large paper mache spider thing that he was uh, zapping in a cave. Yeah. So Matt Smith is uh, is a doctor at this time. He's currently traveling with his companions Amy and Rory. Um, but he's just with Amy in this episode. Rory is not tagging along. Um, mm-hmm. I do enjoy Rory more on episodes. Amy is not my favorite companion, and that's mm-hmm. okay. Um, she is not the highlight of this episode. Bill Nighy and Matt Smith are. They are just mm-hmm. absolutely stellar in this episode. Um, Amy is Karen Gillian, uh, who is Karen Gillian. Incredible. Yeah, who is a phenomenal actress. She's a phenomenal actress, yeah. and I adore her. Um, so, but this this Matt Smith is Matt Smith's doctor is very like goofy, very comical. He is very slapsticky. Mm-hmm. He's also very very sad. Mm-hmm. He is definitely in the era of like the sad emo boy lineup is definitely in there. He is sad. He is dealing with his feelings about the time war, and so he's just kind of messy. He's messy and goofy, but we love him. He's not as sad as like Tenant or anybody, but like he's still pretty sad. <laughs> So, t- so Tenet, 
Tennant is a is a sadder doctor. He's not an emo doctor, but he's sadder. I mean, yeah, he had he he had to say goodbye to Rose. He had to say goodbye to the love of his life, and nobody ever wants to do that. Like that's heart wrenching every time. Okay, and yeah. No one can yell at me for spoilers. That episode's been out for yeah, like sixteen yeah, yeah. years. Please go away. No, no, no. And I <laughs> and and I'm uh, I'm with you there. Might it be? And I'm just gonna throw this out there and you know let people i guess throw grenades at me but uh <laughs> might it be that david Tennant is just a better actor who's able to hit emotion harder and that's why you associate that i'm just throwing i'm you know just saying this no like, i think the they both have very different scripts and very different writers for a lot of things too because you also have to remember this is like the Stephen Moffat, Neil Gaiman era where the, everyone's mm-hmm. just kind of running in and out and Moffat is just running amok <clears throat> just messing yeah. with the fans for all just for funsies. So they, I feel like they're, they were both had challenges presented to them in the material that they were given. All right. I just, uh, yeah, <laughs> I, I have no reason. I will defend them both on that one, honestly, <laughs> but I do love Matt. I do love him so much. They are. I, I actually quite love them both. Uh, I've, I've never seen Matt Smith in something that I did not enjoy him in. And right. uh, I, Always look forward to seeing David Tennant. My first uh, David Tennant experience was uh, um, a Jessica Jones. And, uh, Ever? That, yeah, yeah, I hadn't seen him anything uh, until that. Yeah. Okay. I don't know what else he would have been in other than Doctor Who, which I, just, I didn't want. I feel like you're a very cultured human and you would have found his like poetry readings or his work in Shakespeare or like something like that over the years. Cause he's done a lot of stuff. He's oh yeah. Popular. Yeah. No, no, no. I know. He's done a lot of like, is several I, BAFTAs. If I, I, I'll say this. If I, if he was in like a broadcast or something of something that I saw, I didn't know who he was. David, the first time I remember learning his name as an actor yeah. was Jessica Jones. So I didn't see him as like the lead in anything. Or, he yeah. was phenomenal in that. He yeah. was absolutely stellar. Yeah. Terrifying. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. No, he was absolutely he, terrifying. Yeah, he was amazing in that. And I was like, oh, I didn't. I am very curious about so this. Good guy. at his job. What's that? He was. I didn't finish the series. He was so good at his job. <laughs> I was like, mm, nope. I don't need to be terrified of this man forever. I like him too much. Uh, well, it, you also lucked out because like the last two episodes of that series, oh, that season were not good. Oh. Um, go me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, if you if you bow out of Jessica Jones, uh, I can't remember, it was a 10-episode season, I think. So I think if you bow out at episode after episode eight, like, that's, you're solid. You don't yeah. need to worry about it. I think that's um, what happened. Yeah, pretend something better happened. It, it just, it doesn't end well. It's just one of those ones that's like, oh, that was kind of lame. Unrelated, uh, we are now on Matt Smith's Sad Doctor. Yes. Uh, and uh, that is a key ingredient to this uh, this particular episode absolutely it is and uh so much so that um the episode is uh sort of famous for running the the uh suicide hotline at the end of it yes yes it is but it is very aware of itself i personally find it very loving and very comforting mm-hmm. i find it to be very beautiful and very kind yeah um Ye- thoughtful even um, I very much, but I, there's absolutely a reason why they play that. So, um, there's a, a neat story, uh, and, uh, I'd like either, if, if you know it, Sam, I'd, I'd love for you to, to give it to us, but a neat story about why this episode, like how this episode came to be. I'm not um, familiar with that story. Oh, no. But we okay. should probably say what the episode is. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. Let's, yeah, let's, uh, let's announce the episode. So tonight we are talking about uh, season five, episode 10. It is called Vincent and the Doctor. Vincent and the Doctor. So the neat story. And I, uh, but before we get into that, tell us about the episode. Give me a, a, a full like summary, just very quick, not the play by play, what this episode uh, uh, is about. Like what happens in this episode? So Amy and the Doctor, uh, go back and end up quite in the same town as Vincent Van Gogh, um, stumble upon him and realize that there is a creature torturing him, which checks out for sure. Um, Then fun chaos hilarity ensues 
to helping Vincent, Amy, and the doctor battle this dragon monster that's currently living in their town. Um, and as they go through, they're talking with Vincent about his mental health, mental health and how he's doing. And they're slowly trying to do everything they can to save Vincent, because we all know what happens to Vincent in in history. And they do their best. And as a last ditch effort, they bring Vincent to the museum where there are thousands of people strolling and crying as they view his gorgeous work. And it just shows you that people matter. That is the, the general uh, uh, um, through line of the episode. And it is your, you know, I, I, I get it. It, it. It's, it's that touching. It's that touch. It like, like it really is. Uh, it, you may have never seen an episode of the show, but you, have you don't need probably to. seen uh, this clip. Uh, has traveled around oh. the internet a few times. I, I um, post it at least once a year. Yeah, and and uh, uh, you know we'll show up on a feed of the doctor bringing Van Gogh into the uh, Musée d'Orsay, and he shows him the exhibit where they, you know, Bill Nye he explains uh, greatest artist of all, artist of all time. Yeah, and the way that he uh, tortured, which is something that Vincent Van Gogh. Did not know, mm-hmm. and um, the One or Van Gogh things... as uh, the the British uh, yes. are that kind of him. threw me the first time. I know, the, and I'm the, wondering. The... I I was trying to figure out. I was like, is their pronunciation closer to the Dutch or is ours? And I went and I listened to the pronunciation, and it is Van Gogh, and I yeah. like it is a thing that I'm like, I can't, I can't do what's happening there. So I'm going with Van Gogh. I'm but, gonna let you uh, know our pronunciation is never right. Ever. Oh, I know. Yeah, about <laughs> about anything, about whatever. Um, um, one of the things that I liked about, or uh, that I read about this yeah. episode, is that they very specifically cast Bill Nye. They were going to cast uh, a lesser known actor, but um, Richard Curtis, who is the guy who wrote this episode, who also did Love Actually, which I think is a very cool uh, parallel. Um, of course, it he, is. He. He thought that um, that's that's why it, it was emotion. Is is Richard Curtis like he nails emotion? Right. Um, he said that he felt because the words that he was saying was so important, he needed an actor that people would listen to, and that thus Bill Nye instead of just a regular person. And I, I think also, it's a like it's a great point. That's a great mm-hmm. point. Also, there's no bad time for Bill Nye. No, yeah, no, <laughs> Ever. no, no, absolutely. Ever. I will uh, always listen to him. While we were on the Bill Nye topic, Bill Nye once offered the role of the doctor and uh turned it down my understanding too much uh sort of baggage around like didn't didn't want to be the doctor out in public like you know that's that's who you become in British society i guess i mean you you that's it's very much like that um it's you have to think of it like almost like batman or captain yeah, America. right like you there's stuff that goes with that that's very important there's a certain requirement there's a certain people expect a certain level from you and you i can understand it I, it's I, also where I, a lot of actors get a lot of their starts yeah I, I i feel bad for for poor peter capaldi only because uh i read a bit about the history of him and his love with the show and, and how he'd already been on it how he'd already been on, how he'd been uh, 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 the the president of its fan club until he was kicked off for having like too extreme and a, a position of something. And it's like, just like, he was just such a diehard and uh, like that he gets it. And Peter Capaldi is the doctor. And that is just like, wishes can come true. And Moffat is, you know, as the showrunner becomes the like full writer on the show essentially and all i know is a bunch of fans that i know turned it off around then and go oh that's that are you somebody who, who i'm absolutely out? one of them yeah i'm 1000 percent one of them I, I just it's like it sounds like it should have been the marriage that the show was waiting for it sounds like it should have been the the truest honor of the show and Honestly, it really should have. And it just really, really started to lack chemistry, if we're all being honest. Yeah. Um, the companion at the time, Clara, who was playing opposite of Matt Smith um, right beforehand, 
I feel like her and Capaldi had absolutely negative chemistry. Ugh. Like, just nothing. And I I understand that a lot of companions turn into love interests. I, I like the more homey vibe myself, personally. I don't think everybody needs to be a love interest. Mm-hmm. And I just... Yeah. It still felt like they were trying to push that, even though Matt Smith was gone. And definitely the vibes were not the same anymore. Right. They were not... They, it just... And then I tried to come back when they brought the current doctor around and I just, I haven't been able to fall back in love and it sucks, but yeah. I still, I still love my time period. I still will try to watch it. It, it just, it just, it doesn't hit like Vincent and the doctor anymore. They're just not making the episodes the same. Yeah. And, and that's, I, I think that the, that's the thing that I've heard from, from a lot of other uh, fans too, is just that it's like, if, if you know what it was, and then you you see it now and it's just you know and that that happens to things things you know have those you know blow ups i i community, find it what community has its gas leak here oh, community yeah. but even fourth season of community isn't as far as like like the simpsons now versus simpsons season 2 like i just want to like do that i it's just that kind of uh, massive disparity, but yeah, community had its uh, uh, the gas leak here, and even I think season six is um, kind of just absolute batshit. Like yeah. you know, it absolutely is. You know, I almost to, I almost picked an episode of Community for this. Yeah. Oh yeah. Well, we already we, did an episode of Community, but I would have been fine doing eighteen more. We. Could, I was gonna say we do. We'll do we just do Community, like yeah. yeah we'll do fine. all of them. Walk Done. it through. I uh, uh, wanted to come back to this episode, this Vincent and the Doctor, uh, and again we're talking about all this. You know the 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 impact that this has. So the reason, uh, the key reason that the writer, so Richard Curtis, uh, who wrote Love Actually is buddies with Stephen Moffat, who was showrunner. And, uh, or uh, he had actually, they weren't buddies. I apologize. Uh, the story goes that uh, um, he was, he had written something for him. I can't remember what. But uh, um, in any case, Moffat asked Curtis if he wanted to write an episode. He was just like, you, you know, we want to do an episode. And Curtis said, yeah, I have this idea for this monster uh, I've had this idea for a long time, but it's really about Vincent Van Gogh, and that was the 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 thing that he he said that he wanted to do. And the deal was that Richard Curtis's sister uh, apparently had been a big Vincent Van Gogh fan, and um, had been he says just an absolute marvelous joy of his life, uh, full of life person, and then in midlife basically got hit by severe depression total crash and wound up taking her own life. And, you know, so he really, you know, wanted to drive home this message of the, you know, hang out and see it. And you, you might not live to experience all the joy that you bring to the world, but, you know, you, you owe it to yourself to see the joy that, you know, you do when you can see it, you know, when you can see that joy. And, um, I, uh, you know, I, I think we can all appreciate, you know, the message there. And like you said, the, you know, the idea that people matter. Yeah. Keep filling up your good bucket. Yeah. yeah. Fill the pile of the pile of good things, uh, was uh, such a good a small win is a win. Anything mm-hmm. is a win. Anything Take is it a and win. run. And- uh, and let's talk about. How we get there. So let's do the, uh, we're going to do the the walkthrough of the episode right now. So let's start at the very beginning. The beginning, we're at the museum. We're at the museum. Uh, it is the, uh, uh, the Musée de Orsay, de Orsay and, uh, uh, which is very, very prestigious uh, uh, museum in Paris and has uh, a Van Gogh exhibit. And we are, uh, and at the Van Gogh ex- exhibit, uh, Matt Smith's doctor. Well, first of all, Bill Nighy uh, is there uh, as the uh, the docent, and uh, he is explaining about Van Gogh when Matt Smith's doctor notices something in one of the paintings. It's a spooky thing, so they have to go back and obviously, in true Doctor and Amy fashion, 
we have to go see what's going on. I, I love that it's literally like, I don't know, two brush strokes in a window, like that's yeah. kind of vaguely it's literally like, a like black little the corner. brush stroke. <laughs> and, and he looks at it and says, I've seen true evil before, and this is true evil. <laughs> it's, it's just a little you black. I'd love to see a red flag that, that far away, honestly, at any right. point. And he's like, yep. great. You know what? Good for him, honestly. <laughs> We have to go back to see Doctor Who immediately, or to see uh, Vincent Van Gogh immediately. And so they do, and they hop in the TARDIS. Uh, for people who don't know, uh, describe the TARDIS. The TARDIS is a uh, police box. If you're not familiar with a police box, a police box is a blue British um, old phone booth. If you don't know what a phone booth is, Google it. I can't help you there. Um, and back in the day, you could do like a citizen's arrest and put like a bad guy in this little box and call on the phone. The police would come and get the bad guy out of the box. It's very wild. But that's what the, the doctor and Amy travel in. Um, it has a mind of its own. Sometimes they push and pull and they um, end up where they need to be um, in Vincent City, where they find Vincent at the cafe. And yes. the uh, they just outside of Paris. Mm hmm. Uh, I believe is uh, where they are. He's in a suburb there. Um, and uh, he's in a cafe. And mm -hmm. they ask about him. And everyone uh, seems to know him. Well, yeah, he's kind of like the local crazy. Yeah. Is, for, for, lack of a, for lack of a better phrase. Um, everyone in the town kind of knows him. He tries to pay for, work, pay for things with his paintings and things like that. Oh, the the part where he tried to pay for his his meal or his drink with his paintings reminded me of my favorite food movie of all time, Big Night. And I don't know, it, that was a dumb thing to say, but I wanted to say it. Thank you for adding it. I wouldn't like to no, see that movie. Would, no, that's what we want. That's everything I want. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's a, a, a again. It's okay. I I love the TARDIS. I love the idea of the it's bigger on the inside. Just yes. as again, this whole DIY punk version of sci-fi where it's like we just we find a thing do you we... need a room with bunk bread bunk beds in it all of a sudden he's gonna imagine it it's now in the tardis you have bunk beds enjoy now it's right like, exactly it's a party it, it, whatever we can pretend this is mm -hmm. this is it, it's it's muppet babies but with real consequences it's marvelous um still would watch it that's hilarious i, I totally would it's amazing um but yeah, no. So so uh, they get in the TARDIS. They go to the uh, cafe mm -hmm. and they uh, find out that he's been trying to pay for things with paintings, and nobody likes his paintings. Nobody for, likes his paintings. They find it every of little value. Yeah, of little value. There's nobody. Nobody cares about them. Um, which is a weird thing that happened. <laughs> like like that. That's so common with so many artists and painters. I mean, nothing. Nothing matters until you're dead, really. Yeah. Like, yeah. that's or, when your stuff becomes anything worthy. You'll never see it in your lifetime. Um, because it's finite then. Right. Correct. Absolutely. One of the things, um, Van Gogh, one of my favorite uh, little tidbits about uh, uh, Van Gogh um, that I uh, has always sort of drawn me to him, or at least the understanding, like, his importance as an artist is like when you think of the other, uh, you know, fantastic early 20th century, late 19th century, uh, like artists, um, you talk about like Van Gogh or, uh, uh, you know, Matisse or Cezanne, mm -hmm. like they all painted like between 40,000 and 80,000 things. Like they literally, like literally, like there's, you know, uh, Picasso was like 90,000 yes. something, you know, paintings, so on. Uh, Van Gogh only painted like I think it's like 420 like paintings in his entire life if that but and like if if authentic that authenticating them is yeah. insane right there's been a couple but, that have popped on the market in the last couple of years and oh yeah it, it, it's rough it, it right so again very very few and yet like every one of them is a class every one of them is something that you have seen somewhere in something because every one of them is one of the most famous paintings on earth you've not not seen the sunflowers right right you, right. Can't, you can't look at me and yeah. tell me you haven't 
self-portrait, uh, you know, Starry Night. Like it's just, it's not, yeah. If I had a nickel for every time I saw a Starry Night tattoo, I'd never have to work again. But there are even the ones that like you don't think of. Like the, uh, there's one that I always, I can't think of the name of it, but it's like, there's a bed in a room and it's, it's just like a weirdly proportioned, like, like the, the, Oh, that's uh, a still life of his bedroom outside of Paris. Yeah. yeah that you saw in the episode, which yeah, yeah, yeah. I yeah, thought this, okay. the art direction in this episode was impeccable. Like they yeah. made you feel like you were living inside of some of the paintings with the light. I don't know how they did the light the way they did the light, but they didn't, they didn't. You you were there the entire time in that episode. Mm-hmm. You were there. You were standing next to Amy and Rory. You were looking at Vincent. You you were there, and I think that's part of the powerful part of the uh, part of the episode. It is a powerful message. But as you're saying, Jackie, like it's gorgeous. Oh yeah, you're there. Yeah, they yeah they really want you to 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 see his France and to like you know to 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 feel about it the way his, that he would have felt. Yeah, feel his though- inspiration. Right. And yes. It's absolutely stellar. Even though, again, very much not France. Uh, not filmed in France, right? Very much not filmed in France. No. And and, and one of my favorite uh, devices in the thing is the like, oh, I have a translator so I can just, I can speak to whoever I'm talking to. It sounds English. That's British. everybody. <laughs> that's, that's my they go and, and, Where they go. Everyone has a British accent. The, 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 I love that Van Gogh had a Scottish accent because he's Dutch and not French and they're in France. <laughs> so good. Oh, it was amazing. Um, that that was just lovely. So anyway, so that's the, the, again, it's just this work with what you work with. Come up with a sci-fi reason that this is why you have this and that this is why it solves it. And that's, it's, it's and, then answer, and then you just go hard, no further questions. Yeah. Right, exactly. Of course it's this. It's This is how it works. Thanks so much. Yeah. And 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 yet like literally never resorted to actual magic wand because a sonic screwdriver is not a magic wand. It is not a magic wand. Not a magic wand. Um in any case, uh it's a it uh so they talk to Van Gogh mm-hmm. and they go back to his house and they they have something of a conversation wherein, well, they don't hear about the monster first. No, he, so they're 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 talking. He's talking about it like I don't know. He he's basically talking about like I don't. I'm not sure why you want to come to my house. I don't know. I don't bring any value. I'm not a very good painter. I'm kind of a good for nothing kind of vibe. Um, and then Amy goes outside and she's attacked by the creature. Right. Amy and is then attacked. that's how it gets started. Because right. Amy gets attacked and Vincent runs to save her. Oh, well, I actually, I realized that I am skipping uh, part of the story here, though. Back when they were at the cafe and they're talking to Vincent about going back to his house. And then they hear a scream. A little uh, girl that was murdered. Yes, they were they were hanging out in the cafe and trying to convince Vincent that they wanted to hang out with him and that they liked him. And uh, then they heard a scream. And uh, they go running toward the scream and they find a murdered little girl, unfortunately. Murdered girl. Um, no real evidence, just a dead little girl. But unf- um, the villagers immediately are very upset and all think that it's Vincent. So, <clears throat> okay. There is a, a fascinating little thing here where um, uh, uh, Lindsay and I were like, um, does this have something to do with uh, the Ripper murders. Are they going to somehow like connect this to the Ripper murders? Because it's... They never do. I know. Right. But doesn't it feel like it's supposed to have kind of that who did this thing and like they were going to say that the monster was... Gonna... There was one... Yes, there was one clear spot that I felt that near the beginning. Like I felt, is this going Jack the Rippery? And I had yeah. seen it before, so I don't know why my brain did that. Right. I mean, also, it's a very valid point, but it, it doesn't, and we never loop back to it. We never talk about it again. Wow. We never come back to why the little girl was murdered, except to just, like, further the plot to get them back to Vincent's house, I guess. I don't know. When we when we explain what the monster is, I have to kind of, like, mini rant about how weird his attack pattern is. <laughs> but, but... You absolutely can. 
I just do want to throw it out there that I am, I'm saying the quiet powder out loud. I am tired of the murder and rape of women being used as a plot device. Oh no. Yeah, of course. Yeah. yeah, um, yeah. I think we all just need to say it a little bit louder, but that little girl was absolutely murdered as a plot device for no That's other reason. Horse. So do better uh, writers. Do better. Yeah. 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 Um, um, so yes. And, so uh, we get Vincent out of there and we're going back to his house and we're trying right. to talk to Vincent about how he is not worthless. Wife, life is not, dredge and despair it can get better it does get better right and uh yeah oh yeah and he's trying but he he's also very carefully not explaining why he knows that 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 it gets better for vince or 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 you know i mean he's he's because you're not supposed to right these are things that you're not supposed to do it's like when you go back in time if you go back in time yes everyone wants to go kill hitler obviously it's a logical choice But there's certain things you just, you can't do. And technically what he's doing, they're trying to do the best they can without altering history. Right. Yeah, you can't fuck with the timeline. You can't. Now, well, what's what's interesting about the show that I have always appreciated is the idea of, like, it doesn't have the full sound of thunder. Like, if you step on a blade of grass, that's it. Like, you know, Hitler wins World War II thing. Aggressive. it's like you have to do kind of big things. If you kill Hitler, you would change big, big stuff. If you put a pie in his seat, you just put a pie in his seat. That's all that happened. Nothing really right. changed, you know. So I, I think that's the big part of the mental health aspect of this of of, of this episode as well, right? Right. We, we don't talk about mental health. We don't talk about any of these things. We absolutely didn't do it back then. They just assumed that Vincent was crazy. Right. And right. unfortunately, it does show you that, like, you can toxic positivity, you can it gets better, you can till you're blue in the face. Mm-hmm. Sometimes you can't do anything, and some points in history are finite. Absolutely. And unfortunately, and that-, that is just one of those things <clears throat> that is. There's nothing that could have happened there that would have saved Vincent from himself. Right. Unfortunately. Right, right, right. I will hop in here and tell you how crazy my brain is. I... And always interpreted that as Vincent realizing that that's what he needed to do to get recognized for his genius. That's the way I took that. Like he knew that's the only way he was going to get recognized for what he knew was his genius. So he had to do it anyway. Um, uh, You and I are going to sidebar later and I'm going to show you all of his letters between him and his brother over the years. It's going to be amazing. We're going to have an entire little. We're going to have a strip club Vincent Van Gogh night. It's going to be great. It's going to be great. We're going to have a great time. (laughs) But that's but it's it's a really important part of this episode and showing the mental health of this man as he is fighting this creature and still painting art and still being a good friend, it doesn't define him. Mm-hmm. Right, and that and that uh, again, it's 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 one of those things where it's it's trying to make the the very clear case and says literally several times, and we'll get to that. But the depression and you know, is not a choice and is not a thing about a person not being able to see the good or anything like that. Right. Depression is, is, is an actual, you know, disease and it, it, it functions in its own way. And, um, one of my favorite lines, like of any book ever, I've only read the opening line. There's a book called the noonday demon. Uh, I can't remember who it's by, but it's about depression. Mm -hmm. And I opened the book and the first line was depression is the flaw in love. And I closed the book and I was like, well, that was the best thing I've ever read in my I entire life. Have work. Yeah. But I think the dragon in this episode is like the physical manifestation of the depression. I of think it's Vincent oh. physically fighting and trying. For sure. And it was invisible, just and like it, it is invisible. for everybody else. Just like it is for everyone else. Everybody so, else is an invisible dragon and it's not fun. Yeah. Uh, so interestingly... Uh, it was Moffat's idea to make it be uh, invisible. Um, uh, apparently, it was originally pitched uh, by Richard Curtis as as you know being there, and then they were like, "Well, okay, but you're talking about a fairly large CGI budget for a show that does not do that, uh, no, and, that and whatnot." Budget. And they were like, "Well, how could we, you know, train?" And they were like, "Well, what if only Vincent can see it?" And then that apparently turned into the whole metaphor of the thing um i think it's brilliant now 
uh, uh, again, uh, that might be Stephen Moffat propaganda. I don't know that uh, like um, you, know you you'll I will allow you some light Moffat propaganda. I, yeah, I, I couldn't tell you, but uh, uh, either way, it is a, a brilliant little device, and we're getting to that monster right now. That monster attacks uh, Amy. Yes, and uh, uh, and they go out into the yard, and Van Gogh. Uh, can pick up tools and swing it, but uh, he's just swinging. Bless him. Yeah. Do it. Yeah. Bless him. Um, but yeah, so like he tries, monster goes away. So they go to the church because mm-hmm. that's where the monster's hiding out. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, so the so uh, Doctor Who, after they fight them in the in the yard, he goes and he looks it up. Uh, he looks up the, the monster on his, in the TARDIS, mm-hmm. um, uh, using a thing and it's a monster called a crayfish. Well, he, well, first of all, he figures out that he can see it if it's in a mirror. Yes. Uh, it's, um, it, it, opposite it, vampire. Yeah. It's, it's opposite vampire. Exactly. And so it's a, it's an alien that's apparently from a very brutal race of aliens that is maybe like a giant chicken thing. It's sort of a chicken horse. Kind of a chicken horse. Uh, when you see it. Um, and, and it's got this, you know, big vicious beak and it's got, but it's sort of an owl. It's also like a, an, an owl bear. Uh, it's got this big face. Are you saying it's lightly, slightly like man bear pig? Is that what you're trying to yeah, get Yeah, it's kind of like man bear pig. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> an owl bear is a D&D monster. Uh, if you don't, uh, it's a, it's a giant, it's an owl that looks like a bear or a bear that looks like an owl. Either way, the point is it's, yeah, it's, it's this kind of weird, incoherent, growly monster. It's kind which... of wacky. It's also kind of scary. It's, it's, mm-hmm. it's, it's a, it's a, it's a good, just doctor who put it against a wall monster. It's like they take some darts with body parts on it and then just make a monster. And they, right. and they did. They made and a they did. And its story is that it is from a race that travels around being brutal. Not like eating, just being like viciously brutal. Just being. And sometimes like, one of them will get left behind on a planet and they never come back for them. So that one will just run around on the planet killing things until uh, it is killed by something else. And what I love about this is that I'm like, Wait a minute. It was just in a very crowded street and it killed the one girl and then ran away. And it's like a horse beast thing. Like is it is it thinking? I thought that it was just scared. I don't know that it was yeah, necessarily I like attacking. It was... I think it was just scared. It was no, it abandoned killed the, the murder and girl. It was scared. The... No, I'm saying the girl that it killed in the street. Yeah, but that could just be like I just thought it was him the monster being scared okay. and like freaking out. That is what no, I no, no. And here's what no he he tells the whole backstory that they're like so brutal that they just keep killing they kill until something kills them that's what he said that i know my brain is all screwed up but i legitimately don't remember that okay there's a part where he's going through it's called the crefasis and it's of this brutal race that's just brutal and that just kills and it when one of them is left behind on a planet it will just run around on the planet killing things until something else kills it which other things can't do because they can't see it so i remember this i'm just really mad that they wasted this cool of a villain on a one shot that they didn't execute well right villain wise you know what i mean like villain wise what you just said to me was fucking cool you know what i mean (laughs) what you said was fucking cool and what is on that three does not match that level they are not the same. And now we never get that level of cool because they've already used it. Yeah. That could be an entire series killer. That could be your entire arc is fighting this nonsense, invisible shit. Right. Oh, right. There's so many reasons to fight this thing again. It apparently doesn't come up. I, I, I was reading its own little no. wiki there and it said that it was... Uh, I've never seen it again. Uh, Out of all the episodes faces. I've seen, I've never seen it. Yeah, there's like one reference in one episode where somebody actually says like, oh, he was running around with like a crefasis with its head cut off. And that's apparently the only other time that it's ever come up. Um, we'll just save it for when Sam's showrunner. Yeah. I'm bringing it back. There you go. <laughs> I'm done. And again, I love this idea, but at the same time, I'm like, 
why could it be right behind him and fully about to murder him? And, just and he's him. like, okay, I'm just going to do this. Oh, no. And I'm like, this Maybe thing. Maybe he just... really likes his paintings. And yeah. he, it calms him. Yeah. No, it no, calms but the, the beats. The doctor. At one point, it's just right behind the doctor. The doctor is putting on the thing. And he sees yes. it in the mirror. And it's right there. And I'm like, if a fucking bear is right behind you, right? But then, of course, we do learn something about the beast that it is not only invisible and we'll get to what else it is later because there is a bit of a twist uh to this whole thing um but we then go to uh the church and we try and lure the thing into the church Mm -hmm. and it shows up and traps our hero and his companion and uh van gogh has to come in and rescue the the both of them rescues the both of them and impales them. He impales him. And after impaling him, they discover... With an easel. That's metal. That's metal as hell. Right. And then they discover that the Crefasis is blind. Oh, yeah, it was uh, blind the whole time. Yeah, that he was blind. That That's why it was it could be right next to them and not killing them. That it could and be... And that is why... Sorry. But that's why I stuck on the bumbling thing. That's what right. it was. And now, <laughs> yes, because they are not right. quiet. None of them are quiet. Right. So is it blind and right. just ignores it? Right. So is it not a brutal race? It's just a blind, like you're saying, it is just being startled and accidentally killing things. Because that does make a thousand times more sense that as to sense. why it doesn't kill everything all the time. Like, why wasn't that whole city decimated? Right. Like, the whole if, town. if you had an invisible thing that was a 12-foot, like, chicken bear that could kill whatever, why would it only do one thing and then just run away? So to further the plot. Yeah. I feel like that's a lot of <laughs> to further the yeah. plot. Damn it. Shit. Um. Which again, the show is fantastic about the, and I, 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 I do love whenever it would, it would try and t- like make you feel like they were in peril, and you're like, you know, they're not in peril, right? Like, like, like that's not a thing that's happening. It's a chicken bird. It's, it's chicken bird. Well, and you just know the doctor is just like, yep, this could be where we die, and you're like, I don't know, it's not. If it's not the Cybermen, <laughs> yeah. Or you know what I mean? Like the Ood, the Ood's not doing it. The right. you know what I mean? Stop it. Get out. No. Right, right, right. He's it, it's too yeah, it's not gonna happen in some throwaway episode and some, you know, and so mm-hmm. on. Like um and they just but the show is very like open about the idea of like narrative convenience. This works because I needed it to work right now. This didn't work because mm-hmm. I needed it to work right now. Now I have to do something else. Now we discover some other thing, you know. We, um, we and, and, and learned about ourselves. Yeah, and and before we, uh, before Vincent saves the day, Vincent also, or or no, it is right after this. I'm sorry. Vincent explains about how he sees. I wish I could remember his words. I'm trying to pull them up right now. It's so much prettier than I could ever. Everywhere we look complex magic of nature blazes before our eyes oh that's perfect yeah no it's just yeah too pretty. i can't i can't do it i won't it, 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 there. of other pretty things i thought that the music in this episode was really sweet too there was like one point in the in the cafe where like there was an accordion playing and it was like a theme from like a previous season it was just really sweet and i love little details like that oh that's really neat I, I the song at the end uh, is called Chances, uh, and it is by Athlete. It's a very sweet song. It's very apropos, yeah, uh, for the moment. So after Vincent explains about what he sees and how he sees and so on, and he's very sad because they're going to leave, and they, he, you know, he they told him that they're going to leave. They, they, they can't stay. Yeah, like, because it's, stay. it's not for Vincent's lack of trying. Right. It's, it's not for lack of trying. Like, Vincent wants them to stay. We did he wants dozens one... of babies with Amy. Who doesn't want dozens of babies with her? I, True. I'm I would not kick her out of bed for eating crackers. Right. I, uh... eat crackers on me. It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> but, 
but like so it's not for lack of trying but it's like this really because they, they have made such a connection they have spent so much time together and they've gone through so many things and seen the pain like all of them share different pain but it's all they're all connected you're not alone they're you're, right. you're together you know yeah yeah um so basically uh they're saying their goodbyes and he's like li- 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 one li- just one last thing so he grabs them pulls them pulls them on the tardis takes them to the future back with the gorgeous bill nye in the musée and this is where you really get your big heart heart punch of this episode like you've had your moments before but this ending scene is probably one of the most gorgeously done four minutes of television Mm -hmm. in the history of the world yeah it is it's just a it's a beautiful beautiful moment it is Um, stunning and it's this very detailed moment of all of them standing in the museum in the exhibit and vincent is seeing his own artwork and you can see see the, the, the emotion and then the doctor just turns to Bill Nighy and just goes, and your professional opinion, where does Vincent Van Gogh sit for you? And it's just gushing. Yeah. It's, just, it's best artist of all time. Best, most, 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 most beloved. Popular, most beloved. M- most recreated. Most yeah. inspired. Mm-hmm. Like just goes on and on and he doesn't even know that Ben goes standing right there hearing every word. Oh yeah. And, and then taking... as that finishes, they fucking shuffle him right back out on the TARDIS and drop him off. Put him right back where they got him. Yeah. And they, yeah, so they return him mm-hmm. uh, and he's very happy uh, he's, back. And they, he's, he's in, he's in, he's in pure joy. He's, grateful and going going to miss them but like it's it's time to go right that's not where the episode ends it unfortunately is not where the episodes end um amy and the doctor go back to the present and amy runs to the museum and she comes to find out that there are not hundreds of new paintings there is no more work he does still take his own life weeks after they leave it's still the end of his life. It's still, uh, or it's, I, I think it's just a year. Like it's just a year before it's uh, right before his productive period or, or something. Yeah. It's, it's supposed uh, to be right in there. Yeah. Um, the face is no longer in the church. The monster yeah. is gone. Right. Um, and then they added uh, the for Amy. For Amy on the sunflowers there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. No, it's beautiful. It is a it's a sweet thing, but it's also it's they they deliver the message there that you know he's like, hey, just because we made him happy doesn't mean we we cured his depression. We didn't his erase de- any part of him or who he was. Did right. he? Depressed people have joy. Yeah, mm-hmm. it's nothing right. is nothing is finite like that. Nothing is. Yeah. So yeah, he absolutely did have joy. He did have love. He did have all those things, but unfortunately. He had depression. And he says, but that's that doesn't mean that we didn't add to his pile of good things. He's like, you know, you have a pile yep. of good things, pile of bad things. And he's like, and we added to his pile Definitely of good things, good things. You know. And and so uh it's a um it really is an amazing episode. It, but I thought that was just like one of the like sweetest and best. I was so genuinely happy that they didn't try and like force the message of like, if only people knew how important they wouldn't do this stuff. No, they, that's not it. That's not that, how it works. That's not how it works. But people know then, that people, they're love. Back then people were expecting that from television. So I bet that was a punch to watch that oh when God. it was happening because people expected TV to leave you on a happy ending and that did not. And I bet they were just, tour but that's also british tv not american like, boop, and that's what i was gonna say i was like and then, but that's why i like british and french television a lot yeah and korean because it's real this was the first episode since 1968 to end on a fade to black i didn't know that yeah I, mean, I it i i thought that was really fascinating and and of course it, it obviously was something that they wanted to hammer home and of course it doesn't just end on the fade to black it ends on a 
title card for the National Suicide Hotline in Britain was the the, the original uh, uh, airing mm-hmm. um, because again it was about this message of of not if only you could be happy you'd cure your depression but this is a serious disease and there are tools to fight it it's a beautiful beautiful episode and i thank you for sharing that uh i like i said I'd, i i hadn't watched the show but i had seen uh that clip and i i knew the episode but i you know hadn't seen it so it was it was really it was a wonderful watch i i just I had a great time i'm very very glad that you enjoyed it i know that not Doctor Who is not for everyone. I am not uh, as wild a Whovian as I used to be, but there are some really, really incredible moments in television on that show. Absolutely. On so many different levels. And I just think that episode really shines as some of the best work in the series. Oh, yeah. I, I, I mean, again, there's a reason that that's the one that shared, that that's the one that, that you know, did make it just that kind of round. Uh, well then, uh, I want to say thank you both uh, again for for doing this. Uh, it's uh, always a good time. I really appreciate it. Is there any way people can like keep uh, tabs? Like if they want to go, they listen to this and they're like, "Hey, that person seems cool as hell. How can I go see her do a show? Where can they like find out about your future things?" Oh, if you want to find more out uh, more about me, uh, I can be found on Instagram at s r malloy, m a w l o y. Also, I work with an incredible group of entertainers and fine folk in this town. You can follow us at Blue La La Events. There you go. Uh, so, yeah, so keep your eye on that. Uh, it is, uh, I'll tell you, always a joy uh, to see a host uh, and always a joy to see you just at all. And I miss our smoke sessions and I would love mm. to uh, get mm. that together. And I'd yes. love to do it with the both of you. Cause I oh um photos. I feel like I should probably tell you this, Trevor. We are moving. Oh, so it is done, huh? <laughs> yeah, he got the job in Michigan, so we are moving. Okay, all right. At the beginning of June, like wow. fast. All right, that is. I already soon. started packing. <laughs> yeah, she has. Woo. You guys got a place, or what's happening? No, not yet. I talked to a realtor this morning, okay. but. This is going to be a quick transition. All right. Where are you guys? Where is, are you guys going to have to be? Ypsilanti. Ypsilanti. Out just outside. Mm-hmm. All right. Yeah. So, it's going to be so cool. Sounds like a cowgirl to me. Yeah. Ypsilanti. It's, well, I don't like it, but they call it Ipsy too, which I like, and it ends on an I. So I'm a fan of that. Well, I love okay, me some Michigan. So we have fried chicken here. So that's awesome. Well, go have your fried chicken. I will talk to you all later we're on. We're going to eat Theo's. Okay, bye. Hold my hand, Doctor. Try to see what I see. We're so lucky we're still alive to see this beautiful world. Look at the sky. It's not dark and black and without character. The black is in fact deep blue. And over there, lighter blue. And blowing through the blueness and the blackness, the wind swirling through the air, and then shining, burning, bursting through the stars. Can you see how they roar their light? Everywhere we look, complex magic of nature blazes before our eyes. I've seen many things, my friend, but you're right. Nothing quite as wonderful as the things you see. I will miss you terribly. (laughs) 